Hallelujah. Jesus, we give you praise. You've shown us the way to heaven. Well, welcome. Welcome everybody to worship this morning. I welcome you online. If you're joining us this morning, good morning. Welcome to you and welcome to everyone in the room. And how good are you? Social distancing. Well done. Have you got your dots? Sorry, if you're in the room with us this morning, they have these dots that they have to put beside them so no one sits next to them. A little bit weird, but we're getting there. Uh, there's your dot, thank you. <laughs> Lovely to have you join us this morning. Well, welcome to worship. It is great to come together and praise the Lord. Jesus, we give you praise. Kai's going to come and read to us from our psalm this morning, Psalm 116. Thanks, Kai. Good morning. So the psalm today is 116, and I'll be reading from verses 1 to 2, and then skipping down to verse 12 to 19. I love the Lord... For he heard my voice. He heard me cry for mercy, because he turned his ear to me. I will call on him as long as I live. Now skipping down to verse 12. What shall I return to the Lord? For he is goodness in me. I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is his death of his faithful servants. Truly, I am your servant. Lord, I serve just as my mother did. You have freed me from my chains. I sacrifice a thank offering to you and call on the name of the Lord. In the courts of the house, the Lord, in your midst, Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I love the Lord for you heard my voice. I stand amazed in the presence, yes, of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, love us, 
a sinner condemned unclean. Would you stand with me, those in the room? Feel free to stand at home as well as we sing together this wonderful song, I Stand Amazed in the Presence. Let's gather together and testify this morning to the marvellous love of Jesus Christ. Thank you, band. I want us just to, I want you to take a seat, those standing at home or in the room. And I want us just to pause and reflect on that. How marvelous is our Saviour's love for us? It is marvelous. It is marvelous. It is wonderful. And we stand and we praise and we declare that this morning. But I want us to come now and just sing that chorus quite reflectively as we grasp how hard it is to fully grasp just how marvellous his love is. So can we just prayerfully sing that chorus? How marvellous. Let's bow before the Lord as we sing. Oh 
heads in prayer this morning. We want to give God praise this morning. And we want to come before God and intercede on behalf of others. We want to pray for our core. And as we explore diversity this morning and as Alwyn speaks on hospitality and as we enter into Refugee Week, we also want to pray that we would indeed be a people of diversity and hospitality and pray for those who seek refuge. So let us pray. God, we do praise you. We love you because you heard our voices and you've heard our cry for mercy and you have turned your ear toward us. We praise you because you are gracious and righteous. You are a God full of compassion. Amen. We praise you for you have delivered us from death because we can trust in you. You are our salvation and we give you praise. And we kneel before you this morning and we say, how marvelous, how wonderful God is your love for us. And we pray for us, our core family. We thank you for the freedom and the privilege that is ours to worship you in the room and online today. We thank you for our health and for our core family. We pray especially for those in our core who are unwell, those who are grieving, and we think particularly of the Barnard family today. We pray for those who are worried or anxious, and we ask, dear God, in your love that you would turn your face toward them and give them your peace. Hear us, Lord, as we raise our voices. In you we take refuge. Preserve those whose life is threatened by enemies and who are the target of bitter words or evil schemes. Remember those who are vulnerable and exposed those who are victims of natural disaster, war, persecution, those suffering anguish and sorrow, bring them to safety. In you we take refuge. Give shelter, dear God, to those seeking a hiding place, to those torn from their homes, those who are separated from loved ones, those who are lost or have run away. Bring them to safety. In you we take refuge. You look with mercy and love on all refugees. Help us as a core to welcome the stranger, befriend the lonely and show compassion. Allow your spirit to move in us and teach us to seek justice, to love mercy and to walk humbly with you, telling of all your works. Let us rejoice and give praise. In you we take refuge. Amen. Amen. Time for Kids Spot. Good morning, kids. Good morning. Morning. It's lovely to see some of you back today. And I think I've done very well to get out of my pyjamas and have a shower this morning. <laughs> so good morning. It's lovely to see some of you here and obviously all of our kids online. We miss you. And um, hopefully we'll be all back, be back together not too long away. So we've got a message for you this morning. Now, I've got a bit of a challenge for Lauren. How do you think you will go fitting through this piece of paper? What do you reckon? This what do you reckon, size kids? Piece of paper. Do you reckon Lauren can fit through this size I piece of paper? So. You don't? <laughs> or People guess saying fit through, yes. I, yeah. I can't fit through. A finger? A, a toe? <laughs> I'm gonna give you five seconds. So I hope you're thinking oh. this morning. Okay. You have got five seconds to come up with a plan. Okay. So thinking, thinking, kids, you might want to think too. You need a plan. And okay, along with it. the plan, what tools might you use? Can I have a practice round first? Because sometimes when we, we, we have a go, we do our best, but then we need to rethink. Sure. Our plan. Can I do that? Is that all right? Better be quick. Okay. Yep. All right. Yep. Can yep. I have a go? Yep. Have a go. Have okay. a quick. Have a quick go. All right. Ready? Well, you kind of got a little bit of you through, but I want you to get all of you through. Like, all of you. Every okay. bit. All right. So. 
every good planner okay. needs some tools. I do. What have you got? I Show have us. A pair of scissors. Yeah, scissors. And I've got new paper. New paper. Okay. Well, I'm going to let you get on with your plan. Okay. And I'm going to have a little chat. So let's let Lauren get on with her stuff. Now, sometimes in our lives, things seem impossible, don't they? Things that we think we're never going to get through and they seem impossible. What are some of the things that, that our kids go through? What about school? School sometimes is pretty tough and comes with lots of challenges. The challenge to get out of bed, the challenge to find your shoes, to get organised, or maybe that's a parent's challenge, but a challenge. But what about the challenges of the demands of school, the keeping up with the homework? What about sometimes those bullies, those people that pick on you relentlessly? Sometimes those situations seem impossible. What about moving house? There's quite a few of us that have moved house. That comes as a big challenge, to move house, to make new friends, to start in a new school. What about all the things we've seen on the media lately around COVID-19 that might have the potential to really frighten us and we don't see any way through all of that? Some of it seems impossible to kind of just keep going. What about some of the pressures of social media? A huge thing these days. Even the cyberbullying that goes on, the having to keep up appearance and, you know, always make sure that you look good, the checking all the time to see if you've got the most likes from what you've posted. Those pressures are huge and sometimes it seems that there's no way through. But, you know, God in the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 19, 26, that with man things are impossible. When we look at things through our own eyes, things seem impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And I want you to remember that when you go through all of those things that you think there is no way through, that when we look through our own eyes, things are impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Now, I'm going to put a hold on that because I reckon Lauren's getting somewhere. We ready? <laughs> Has the plan worked with the tools that Lauren was given? Because it's not just for us, church, it's for everyone on all oh, my <laughs> Wordy word. Has it it's worked? It's really live. <laughs> it did work, but I ripped it up. Oh. Okay. okay. That's where it ripped. Camera, can you see? It, it did ripped. There, but it it was fine. did work. <laughs> So. Find it ripped. Let's see. Can she get through? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well done. But you see, for that to work minus the rip, Lauren needed a plan and she needed the tools. Just as with God to do the, the make the impossible possible in our own lives, He also gives us the tools. He gives us His Word with promises on every page that God is never going to leave us. He gives us adults in church that we can trust, that love us, no matter what kind of day we're having. And we miss you, kids. And we feel very privileged to be able to invest in your lives. He gives us prayer. Doesn't matter where we are, what time of the day it is, whatever, that God just wants us to speak to him and we can take everything to him in prayer. But it doesn't mean that everything that we want, we get. Because the thing I love to remember is that God has a much bigger plan than I have. And the things that I desperately want to come true in my life, maybe that's just not part of God's bigger plan. So just remember that. God is the master planner. He's got it all under control. He gives us his word. He gives us each other. He gives us prayer. Um, and he makes the impossible incredibly possible. Amen. Thanks, ladies. That was great. Even the ripping. It's great, Lauren. Uh, then over the next few weeks, we're having a small segment in our service on looking at the different values of uh, the Salvation Army and for us as a core 
And last week we explored integrity. We had the lovely Erwin share with us all about integrity last week. Yes, lovely Erwin. Um, share with us about integrity. So today we're looking at diversity. And when I say to you, when you hear the word diversity, what are the observable behaviours that you witness in someone that embraces diversity? Well, to help us unpack it a little bit more today, we have the lovely Haley and Alwyn, and they're going to... Ex- um, the lovely Alwyn, sorry, I should, I should be consistent. I should be consistent. They're all lovely, and they're here to share about diversity. So let's, let's turn our eyes and ears towards them. Thank you very much, lovely Deborah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a real privilege to be able to introduce you to uh, this person. Now, some of you might be aware who, who she is. I imagine many of you are. But I'm going to make the assumption that not everybody does. So in a quick nutshell, a couple of sentences. Who is Hayley? Are you sure you only want a couple of sentences? Well, we I'm haven't got a lot of time. Okay, I'll try my best. So firstly, I know that I'm a child of God. Amen. Um, secondly, I know who I was born to be. So I know I'm a mother and my father's daughter, born in South Africa. Um, I know the choices that I've made. So the choices are that I'm a wife, I'm a mother, I'm a teacher, I'm a tuba player, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> I'm a salvationist. So those are the choices that I've made. Mm-hmm. Some things no control over other things I've made choices. Um, I'm a new Australian, so I'm a migrant. I'm a person of color. So when it comes to diversity, I think yeah. a few things about me. You've just introduced the idea of diversity for us, and Deborah has as well, but uh, for you, um, when we were imagining who could probably speak in that space, you came to mind because of all, all those dynamics of your life in another land. But what, what, uh, if you had to describe uh, what the meaning of diversity is, what is it to you? What, is it, what do you explain it to be? So when I think of diversity, I think of the fact that we've all been created differently, uniquely, very differently, separate DNAs. But even with saying that, we are all still equal. Mm-hmm. So equal because we are, God created us in his own image. So we are all equal, but also because we are all equal in that salvation is offered to all of us. So regardless of whether it be your cultural heritage, your age, your gender, your social, economic, intellectual status in society, it doesn't really matter because we are all equal. And because we are all equal, um, in God's eyes, we should also be treated equally. We should be accepted and loved equally so that nobody feels inferior or superior and everybody feels valued. Mm. So That's a pretty good explanation and understanding of it. Where do you see uh, that value of diversity in scripture or, in, or even the life of Jesus perhaps? Okay. So in scripture, starting in Genesis with God created male and female, I could go to Revelation and say, you know, right at the end, it promises us that all nations and all tribes are going to be standing for the Lamb of God. I could go to Galatians and say, well, you know, Paul reminds us that in Jesus, in Christ Jesus, there's no difference between Jew or Greek, male, female, slave or free. I could say all of that, but, which I just did, mm-hmm. but... <laughs> For me, when you look into scripture to find diversity, you actually look at Jesus. And we want to be more like Jesus in everything that we do. So when we look to Jesus, we see that he broke the barriers, the boundaries of diversity because he loved, included, incorporated everybody. Whether it be when it came to age, yes, he healed and even brought to life older people, but he also did the same with younger people. You know, Jairus' daughter, we think of, he hung out with men, but he hung out and got to know women as well. We think of Mary and Martha. We think of Mary Magdalene. Um, We think of the Samaritan woman. So we can see that, yes, we think of the disciples normally, but we also think of the women that he hung out with, or even culturally, the Samaritan woman, again, was somebody from a different culture. So 
Jesus got to know people of all ages, different cultures, rich and poor, whether it be, you know, who knows, the fisherman who might have been really, really poor or could have been Luke who was the doctor or who knows who all these different people are that Jesus actually got to know everybody, preached to everybody, spoke to everybody, mm. dined with anybody and everybody. So yeah. for me, it was just look to Jesus and you'll see diversity, yeah. really. So. Yeah. There's a lot of lessons for us there. And, and I, just, I guess as a congregation of the Perth Fortress Corps, how do, we, how do you see diversity expressed in our ministry of the Corps, perhaps? Okay. When you look around, it might seem like there's no diversity. <laughs> Somebody walking in through the front door might say, yes, we've got male and female. We've got young people sitting on one side, slightly older people on the other side. Oh, dear. <laughs> uh, you know, we, we have a little bit of diversity. And then it might even appear that we have the token person of color or ethnic background, uh -huh. and it seems quite tokenistic in, in, in many ways. But I think many of us don't realize what's actually happening outside. We think of mainly music, where we have people from different cultures and ages being incorporated into our, our fellowship and our worship. We think of our literacy group, people from different religions and cultures and backgrounds and new migrants coming in. And we think of our children's church, where we connect all the time with different, and we include and love people equally and separately. Um, and they are different, but included the same way. Well, I just look at myself. <laughs> um, I think, as testament to this call in particular, when I walked in and I approached the band, I went up to the band and came in for my first band practice. They may have thought I'm a bit strange. <laughs> um, because Do you think that was a bit, what was why? Why? Yeah. Because it was an all male group when I arrived, right. firstly, totally all male. Um, I was probably the only person of color who stood there. I was little <laughs> compared to all of them, so I'm <laughs> even thinking, you know, size matters. Like and they gave you a tuba. And then <laughs> I asked for a tuba. <laughs> and they may have thought, strange woman. Um, <laughs> but they didn't question. They in included, loved, accepted, embraced me as a person. Not because of or treated me differently in any way. If I said I wanted a tuba, they may have thought, are you sure you can handle this? <laughs> um, but they gave it to me. Yeah. And, and that's it. So when you feel as if you are not different, I've been given leadership positions. So by doing that, even though I am different and I've come from outside, I am part of the whole. Yeah, yeah. You've given us a bit of a challenge to think some things through there as a congregation. Ha just one thought then, the last, last question for you. How could we be better at being a people of diversity, valuing diversity? Okay. How can we be better? So when we think of being better, not because we're not doing it, but better, we need to be more informed. We need to be more informed, not just one side of the coin, but to know people, not just the facts and the data, not just to see what has been written or recorded, but we actually have to be informed and get to know people individually. We need to speak to people. Mm. So when somebody comes in who might be different, a greeting is not enough. It's an hi is not enough. You actually have to get to know people and speak to them and get to know them well. Mm. I know that I was embraced into people's homes straight away. I was invited, you know, come over, have dinner within the first week or two, people got to know us as a family. Yeah. So that is one That's of the good. things that we probably could do better mm -hmm. by getting to know people individually, okay. um, really, really individually, mm. and accepting them, loving them, including them. And probably the next thing, 
is to not try and change okay. the differences. Not assimilating, but embracing the differences. Amen. Amen. So for example, if we don't mind, give yep. me one example. And I can only speak from personal experience yep. again. If I wanted to, because culturally, I'm from Africa. And if I wanted to sing and dance in the aisles, would it be looked on strangely? Or would it be, this is the way she does it, let her be? <laughs> or would it be, you know, no, no, you need to learn our ways. So my thing is about when you speak about diversity and embracing diversity, it's about letting people be different, but treating them equally. Very good. It's quite challenging, but awesome words, isn't it? Uh, great insight into what it, the value of diversity represents. The sense of equality, but embracing the difference as well. Thank you very much, Hayley. Didn't you do well? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. We, um, I'm going to hand it over to our worship team to lead us in some worship, and Russell's going to lead us as we sing some songs and give praise to an awesome God. God bless you. Good morning, everyone. In Christ alone is our strength. And thank you for those words again, Hayley. Um, I wish she was my English teacher at school. I really do, because I would have enjoyed English so much more. Um, would you join me as we stand and we talk about, in this song, how much Christ is our strength. Christ is our basis and nothing else. Because if we get it right with him, the other things will fall into place and we'll understand the importance of diversity and the importance of how we need to treat each other. Because Christ is our goal, Christ is our strength, and Christ is our example. In Christ alone my hope is found, He is the light, my strength, my soul, His cornerstone, His solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, where peace are still, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless pain, His gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones He came to save, till on the cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied, for every sin on Him was laid.
you, but that was pretty powerful, I thought. God will make a way. We talked about before how there wasn't a way through this piece of paper. Well, my God would have actually taken me through the paper somehow, and I don't know how he would, but actually without cutting it, we know that is possible because all things are possible through him. And when there seems no way in our lives, we need to trust. And so this is sort of a beautiful song that talks about when you can't see the way through, you need to give it over to him. Whilst we should have already given it over, sometimes we need those challenges to accept. We need to give it over to Christ. There's a chorus that breaks into a verse halfway through. We may not quite know it so well, so I encourage you to sing along as you, you understand the song. But a beautiful words. God will make a way when there seems no way. God will make a way through. Good morning. Today's Bible reading is from Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 through to chapter 10, verse 8. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These 12 Jesus sent out to, with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles 
or enter into the towns of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely you give. Amen.
fantastic hymn of praise and wonder and worship. Now, uh, we had the kids' time before, and the, I'm giving directions to if you, the kids can go out with Lauren uh, for a few minutes. Uh, are you going to play with paper and try and get through the paper holes? Yeah. <laughs> cool. And for us in the room, and for those of you online, of course, in your, in your own rooms, we're going to read for the scriptures from Genesis, Genesis 18. Genesis chapter 18, the first 15 verses. The story of uh, three visitors, three strangers that came to Abraham. So Genesis chapter 18, from verse 1 through to 15. The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. He said, If I have found favour in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought, and then you, will be out, you, you may wash, all wash your feet and rest under this tree. Let me get you something to eat so you can be refreshed and then go on your way, now that you have come to your servant. Very well, they answered. Do as you say. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah. Quick, he said, get three sears of finest flour and knead it and bake some bread. Then he ran to the herd and selected a choice tender calf and, ga and gave it to a servant who hurried to prepare it. He then brought some curds and milk and the calf that had been prepared and set these before them. While they ate, he stood near them under the tree. Where is your wife Sarah? They asked him. There, in the tent, he said. Then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already very old and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself at, as she thought, after I am worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she lied and said, I did not laugh. But he said, yes, you did laugh. This is the word of the Lord. Now I want to spend some time uh, uh, looking at, at the story of Abraham uh, and these three strangers. It's an interesting narrative, don't you think, uh, about a particular day in their lives. And I want to propose from the story uh, there is two main thoughts or themes for us to consider. And it might be, they go back to back, but it might feel like there's two short talks here and then one sermon. So bear with it. The two themes are hospitality and hope. Hospitality and hope. And they've been introduced in our meeting already. But firstly, hospitality, and it focuses on the first eight verses there. If you want to look at it in front of you, um, the first eight verses of that chapter. But what are you like at meeting a stranger? How good are you at meeting strangers? Some of us are generally pretty good. We don't we like the adventure of meeting new people. Or well, some of us aren't too keen to get to know people and we all avoid them as, at all costs. And the rest of us probably swing between the two depending on the circumstances or the situations. And in our story we have Abraham encountering these uh, three strangers. Did you notice how he was towards them? It's quite interesting. It was customary uh, to offer hospitality to travellers back then. This was the expected thing to do and the common practice. In ancient times, desert-dwelling uh, Bedouins would welcome travellers into their tents and they offered them a rest from the heat of the day. And Abraham did that, but he went much beyond, far beyond the customary expecta expectations. He hurries out to them, it says. He postures himself lowly before them. He sought their favour and he invited them to be his uh, esteemed VIPs and to receive his hospitality. Abraham regarded these strangers as honoured guests. Something to eat in uh, verse 5 uh, actually just literally means a morsel of bread. So he offers them a piece of bread. But what he put in front of them was like a three-course banquet. He, uh, he managed to get uh, the best calf. He uh, made milk and curds, which is like a, a, a dessert. It's like a three-course banquet he put before them. The best breads. A bit more than a piece of bread. And you might be persuaded to think that Abraham went to all that effort because he knew it was the Lord that was with him. But Abraham actually didn't realise it was the Lord until later in the story, if you noticed, well after he had wined and dined them. 
his hospitality was quite extraordinary because of how extreme it was towards who clearly were strangers to him. Uh, Deborah says that she doesn't have the gift of hospitality. Uh, she says that because she reckons she can't cook. <laughs> There's lots of stories there and I don't have time for them here. Uh, but I am certainly no better. I say that we both do not enjoy cooking. Um, and I enjoy food as my protruding middle uh, suggests but mostly when someone else does the cooking but having the gift of hospitality is not essentially about being able to cook up a a yummy uh, feed (laughs) amen it is much more about who we are catering for than the quality of our food hospitality in the proper sense is the express concern and practical care of the stranger in need hospitality is about strangers now that is much harder to swallow, isn't it? Because our world presents numerous challenges when it comes to practicing hospitality towards the stranger. In our culture, people live increasingly individual lives, seldom going ever beyond our inner circles. We live in a a self-protective age where parents must warn their children against strangers who knows what might be lurking behind a kind and gentle face. Even in our church life, in our salvo world particularly, we can keep to ourselves, don't we? And the general result of all this is that we rarely move towards the stranger. So this means that true hospitality involves a fair degree of risk, moving towards that which is unknown, without the certainty of being how we were received. Yet the reality of hospitality towards the stranger is essentially important in the life of the church and in the life of God's people. The early Christians received instructions in Hebrews Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. And Jesus actually said that uh, a lack of hospitality is a reason for judgment, and the resistance to showing hospitality to strangers is likened to having a resistance to showing hospitality to God himself. If you know the passage in Matthew 25, I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. Whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, he says, you didn't do for me. And he goes on to say, then they will go away to eternal judgment. That's quite confronting, isn't it? Hospitality is rather important to God. In fact, it's very important to God. Hospitality to strangers is vital in being God's people and in fulfilling God's mission in the world. We can ask ourselves, so who are our strangers? They come to us as refugees escaping their world of terror and war. Very topically, uh, here today is the start of Refugee Week in Australia. They come to us as immigrants, illegally and illegally, looking for a hope of a better life. They come to us, those different to us, in culture, in colour, in creed, needing acceptance, understanding and respect. They come to us as the poor, the lonely, the abandoned, the marginalised, the outcast, as, and as those who depend on the gener- generosity of others to survive. And there are two things to remember for us as a people of God in this. Firstly, hospitality is a feature of the life of worship. In our setting of worship, the ground is the table of our Lord Jesus Christ. The table is the place where we receive hospitality from our gracious host, who is the Lord. God loved us first as strangers and welcomed us to his table as his honoured guests. Therefore, the table calls us to extend hospitality to those who are our strangers. Our worship services and indeed all our expressions of ministry and Christian life ought to be settings in which the stranger is welcomed in foremost ways. Because if a stranger is is feeling unwelcome with us, then we are not being God's people. And secondly, this passage not only involves human hospitality but hospitality to humans, but hospitality towards God. Hospitality toward God is not simply a spiritual matter. It is a response of the whole self amid the everyday affairs of our everyday life. And although we may not be able to always identify and be aware of the presence of God in our everyday life, God assumes flesh and blood in our neighbours, in our work comrades, in our school friends, in our teachers, in our shopkeepers, in the garage attendant, in our bank tellers, 
You get the picture? In every person we meet. Just like Deborah reminded us last Sunday, every person, and indeed every stranger, bears the image of God, the Imago Dei. Therefore, hospitality towards every person is hospitality to God. Okay, that's the first short talk. Now the second one. <laughs> hospitality was the first. The message of hope is the second. And it's based on that, the, the second half of that passage from verses 9 to 15. Because they've had their meal now with these strangers and the conversation gets going. And the pur- purpose of the visit of the visitors and the identity of the visitors becomes clear now to Abraham. The promise of a son is made. Chapter 17 tells us that, uh, that he had already received, Abraham had already received the message from God and hearing it again caused him to realise now actually this is God that's with me telling me again. What is notable though is on this second, second occasion is that Sarah now becomes the focused person and the recipient of the promise. So let's not dance around the fact here. Um, Sarah was 90 years old. The days of her being able to bear children were well and truly gone. Conception, let alone birth, was impossible. It's perhaps surprising that uh, she laughed because you probably think she'd probably want to cry. (laughs) 90 years old and being a mother. But we have to remember that she had always wanted a son and she was yearning for that day. So she laughed still at the ridiculous idea of describing herself and she says i'm a decrepit old woman i'm i'm worn out she says considering the facts it's comical that she could be a mother and in her laughter the name of a son is foreshadowed it it was the same response that abraham had given if you know the story and he laughed when he was told as well the boy's name would be yishak that's in hebrew which is isaac in our understanding which means he or she will laugh or laughed But the significance of Sarah's um, laughter goes far beyond choosing a a baby's name. Her laughter becomes the occasion to draw in a very important theological point from the passage, that what the Lord was about to do and to fulfil his promise was a matter that was way too beyond the comprehension of those who were receiving it. Is anything too hard for the Lord? In verse 14, it was more a rhetorical question. It was to invite this unbelieving couple into the world of belief in the creative, life-giving power of Yahweh. He will not fail to fulfill his promise because God is the promise keeper. He has been doing this with every person who has ever lived. His, ca- his character is love and he has loved every person who has ever lived. He made a way for them. He sent his son to be their saviour. Such is his love. God loves us and that's a promise but I also recognize this we can be like Sarah and hear a promise from God and struggle to believe it it's the struggle that we are, when we can be faced with what seems and certainly appears to be the impossible when all evidence provides no reason when all reality provides no hope when all we feel is helplessness when all we hear is doom and gloom when you're a 90-year-old woman and you're going to have a child. I don't want to sugarcoat this. When we are faced with such challenge, we can genuinely struggle and struggle to hold on to faith in God and our human response may well be to scoff, to laugh in disbelief. Yet, and I think we had this idea introduced a little earlier with Russell, this is perhaps a time when all that we have is faith. And somehow in our desperate sense of the impossible that we find God because he is the wonderful promise keeper. Amen. And like Abraham and Sarah, the answer to the question, is anything too hard for God? No, nothing is impossible to God. For just as God said, one year later she gave birth to a son and his name was, he was named Isaac. And that is in chapter 21 of, our, of Genesis. God serves as the source of hope in situations where the way into the future seems entirely blocked off. God gives shape to possibilities when all around us seems impossible. The active engagement of God amid the problems of daily life opens up the future rather than closing it down. We have a wonderful God who can do the impossible. So are you in need of hope today?
Is anything too hard for God? I ask you that. We're going to sing a song in a few moments. Um, it's a song that we sang a little earlier. We're going to sing it more prayerfully uh, with, a, with that sense of, of, of faith as well. God will make a way. And as we sing this song, I want us to remember the call to hospitality upon us as God's people. Uh, what does it mean for you and I to, uh, to welcome the strangers in, into our world and to understand them and respect them and offer them space to be God's people? And as we also, we, we sing this, so let us remember how Abraham and Sarah, when facing the impossible, how they were invited into the world of belief in God who can do the impossible and receive the promise-making God who knows our struggles and can fill us afresh with hope. So I invite us to be prayerfully responding as we sing this song and give focus to him in this space. us to be a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we lay ourselves before you in wonder and in worship. You love us far beyond our comprehension and we offer our lives to you in gratitude and service. We remember that day when Abraham and Sarah and accept the challenge to welcome the strangers in our world. Forgive us for the times when we have not been welcoming before and help us to understand what it is to love like you love. Lord, we also confess our struggle to believe when all we see, what we see, is the impossible. So help us to hear your words, your words of hope and believe that nothing is impossible for you. And we admit it's hard sometimes. We seek your grace and we seek your spirit's strength to hold on in faith with you and to believe. Our hope is in you, Lord. Father, we he hear our cry. We ask in the name of the Christ, through the Spirit. Amen. Let's just sing that chorus as a final declaration. God will make a way where there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way
Good morning, Perth Fortress family, everyone here, and good morning to all of you at home. We miss you very much, and we can't wait for our family, our Perth Fortress family, to be together again. And hello to everyone around the world who are joining us online today. Thank you. It's been a great meeting so far. Um, I'm just doing the announcements now, so... May I please ask that you remember the Barnards in your prayers as their son Jason passed away yesterday unexpectedly. And at this stage there are no further details. Thank you very much to the Men's Fellowship yesterday. It was a great day. Um, we worked in this area, the hall. Um, we painted, we repaired, we replaced the light bulbs in all the lights. And as you can see, everything that was pink is no longer pink. So, yes. Now, also, I just have to do this. There were many men who apologized. They would have loved to have been here, and um, they just couldn't make it. So we had 22 men turn up. Thank you very much to Peter Barker, Russell Gilchrist, Kai Gilchrist, Dennis Dahl, Charlie Studser, Sam Gibson, Matthew Barker, Alan Terrell, Charles Galliott, Jackson Lee, Jaden Wrigley, Eric Platts, James Platts, Ken Smith, Troy Reynolds, Marcus LeCount, Paul Ineson, Al Robinson, Stuart Clack, Nathan Clack, Joel Gibson, and myself. So thank you very much, guys. That was a great day. We have set up the Centenary Hall today with a cap for a capacity for at least 40, along with 100 in the main hall. So that whenever you feel well enough or want to come back, there's enough space to come back. And um, yeah. Our next messy church will be on the 28th of June, and we are looking forward to gathering together again instead of being online, and it will be at the usual time of 4.30 p.m. There will be great activities based on the theme of Adam and Eve, so we encourage you to invite grandchildren and friends and neighbors with young families, and this ties in with our theme of today. We are still able to receive any funds that you wish to send for self-denial or Red Shield appeal if you are still thinking of, spend, of sending those in. For the collection today, we will be receiving it as you leave the hall, please, the same way as last week, to prevent it from being passed from person to person. And one more. Can you... Um, the entertainment books are available, and there is a link on the screen for the website. For every book sold, we get $14 for the call, so it's a great fundraiser. Thank you very much. Well, I invite you to stand together as we sing our closing song this morning. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. We'll sing the song straight through. Thank you, band. Let's conclude our service together.
a blessing to each of us wherever we may be this morning. In light of what has been read and preached to us today, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. God bless you. Oh, you are